Hey there, it's me, Ripper the Clown, the unpredictable cartoon character come to life. And you know, there are a lot of weird mysteries in the strange, strange world of professional wrestling, such as how did Vince McMahon survive that limousine explosion back in 2007? Was the Shockmaster deliberately pushed through that wall on live television during his failed clash of the champion's debut? What about the conspiracy of William Regal's lack of a WWE or ECW world title reign? What I would consider to be the biggest mystery of all, how did three-fourths of the contemporaneous WWE roster get their jobs in the first place? Other mysteries include, is John Cena a descendant of those Easter Island head things? Are Papa Shango and Kama the Supreme Fighting Machine the same guy because, you know, they really freaking look alike? How is Beth Phoenix in the WWE Hall of Fame but Miss Elizabeth isn't? And speaking of Hall of Fame mysteries, when will Bruiser Brody, Brian Pillman, The Midnight Express, Bobby Eaton, and Stan Lane and William Regal get inducted? How many wrestling incarnations did Ed Leslie have throughout his career? Who was who? And why did Jade the Snake Roberts hate Randy Macho Man Savage and the lovely Miss Elizabeth so much that he would sabotage their wedding reception back in 1991? <sighs> well, I can tell you, it was because Jake wasn't invited to Macho Man's bachelor party. It's true. Look it up. And what about the strange case of the Ultimate Warrior? And how for decades the WWE hated the Ultimate Warrior. And they repeatedly said that he was one of the worst and most unprofessional wrestlers in history. And hell, they even released a DVD about how he sucked. Yet, after years of publicly bashing the Ultimate Warrior, both personally and professionally, suddenly the WWE loved the Ultimate Warrior, publicly praising him as one of the most inspirational and professional wrestlers in history. And hell, they even released several DVDs telling us how great he was. If this behavior isn't a mystery, I don't know what is. Those mysterious mysteries aside, I decided to tackle a mystery that no one has ever looked into before. It's like being the first investigator to look into and question the JFK assassination. It's like being the first investigator or journalist to reveal the UFO crash at Roswell. It's like being Bernstein and Woodward breaking the Watergate scandal. Because to the best of my knowledge, no one, and I mean no one, has ever investigated in question whether or not WWF wrestler Nails, a.k.a. the prisoner, a.k.a. Nails with an S at the end instead of a Z at the end, was truly guilty of the crimes he was in prison for. No one has ever investigated this pro wrestling mystery. I've never seen it on Unsolved Mysteries back in the day. I never heard John Walsh talking about it back in the day on America's Most Wanted, and there have been no investigation, discovery, or History Channel documentaries regarding the Nails case, which to me is just a travesty. And for me, it's just more evidence of a broader cover-up. So after years of being overlooked, Ripper the Clown is now on the Nails case. You see, Nails was with the WWF from April until December of 1992, and during that approximate eight-month time span, we learned little about the crimes that Nails allegedly committed. Nails, nor his arch nemesis, the Big Boss Man, ever publicly discussed the crimes that put him in prison. Um, you know, other than Nails repeatedly claiming police brutality and vehemently and consistently claiming that he was falsely imprisoned. Everything was discussed vaguely and without any real detail. But here is what we do know. During Nails' eight-month reign of terror in the WWF, Vince McMahon repeatedly told the WWF audience that Nails was incarcerated for over 2,000 days. That's approximately six years. Therefore, we're definitely looking at a felony here. Strangely, this time frame is bizarre because it contradicts other tangible video evidence. You may have heard of Mr. Magnificent Kevin Kelly. No, not that Kevin Kelly. This Kevin Kelly. Many people have stated that Kevin Kelly is actually Nails. And if this is true, we have a plethora of video evidence that Kevin Kelly was free during the six-year period before Nails surfaced in the WWF, directly contradicting Vince McMahon's claims. Kelly was wrestling for the AWA. So if Vince McMahon publicly claimed that Nails spent almost six years in prison, how can we explain the countless hours of video documentation indicating that he was, in truth, a free man? wrestling under the name Kevin Kelly for Vern Gagne and the AWA. Alas, this is ruddy mysterious. The late great Bobby the Brain Heenan repeatedly said that Nails received a parking ticket when he was inside a floral boutique buying his mom flowers for Mother's Day. Now Heenan specifically said that this violation happened on Mother's Day itself. 
So if we use Vince McMahon's questionable six-year time frame to gauge a year, this means that the offense Heenan spoke of would have occurred on May 10th, 1987. Again, on a Sunday, because Heenan said that it occurred on Mother's Day. And keep in mind, this was back um, during you know a period of our society where most locally owned businesses such as flower shops were closed. They were always closed on Sundays. So, um, you know, this information from Heenan actually provides more questions than answers. Heenan explained that the ticket went unpaid because it blew off the windshield and uh, when Nails was in the floor boutique and thereby Nails never got the ticket and he was subsequently in prison for lack of payment and, um, you know, that, you know, essentially made him inmate number 902714. And uh, Heenan said that he received this information from Nails' sister, someone that you know, we could, or and rather should, consider to be a reliable source. But who is his sister? What was her first and last name? Or did she only have one name like her brother? We don't know. We don't know. Maybe Bobby Heenan knew, but if he did, he took that secret with him when he passed away. God bless his brilliant, ingenious soul. And additionally, there are a plethora of other unresolved, unanswered questions, such as, if Nails just got out of prison, was he on parole? And if so, how was he able to tour around the country and the freaking world with the WWF? When you think about it, leaving the state of whatever state he lived in and touring the world on national TV to boot as proof of his gallivanting around, it all had to be a parole violation that definitely would have sent Nails back to the joint. You know, during his short run on WWF TV, Nails always professed his innocence. Sure, he was angry. Sure, he wanted revenge. And yep, he was extremely brutal. I mean, he brought an animalistic brutality to WWF TV that was kind of unseen before that point. I mean, hell, he retired Sergeant Slaughter after a beatdown with chairs and a billy club that kind of resembled a mugging. He flogged people with that nightstick that he stole from the Big Boss Man, a crime that we all saw Nails commit on national TV, but a crime that was apparently left unreported to authorities. Yet again, the public theft of the Big Boss Man's beloved nightstick would have been another overt parole violation. And sure, yeah, you know, Nails was kind of irate all the time. And yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say that Nails seemed downright psychotic. But hey, if you were falsely accused of and in prison for unknown crimes for, if you want to believe Vince McMahon, over 2,000 days, you'd be a little pissed off when you got out of the joint too, man. You know, looking at Nail's behavior and his overall demeanor, it's obvious he was traumatized by his time in the prison system. And even after paying his alleged debt to society, when he was released, he was still mistreated when he went back into normal society. I mean, hell, the referee, the WWF referee, would frisk him before every match, you know? And Nails would slink out of the ring like he was escaping under a barbed wire. The WWF announcers repeatedly referred to him as a convicted felon and said that he still should be in prison for his unknown crimes against society. And in another prison reference, Nails' short-lived finishing move was actually the electric chair. And for reasons completely unknown to anyone, Nails constantly wore his prison jumpsuit with his numbers on the back. Personally, I believe that a part of Nails' constant aggression and obvious trauma undoubtedly came from years of not being believed by anyone other than his unnamed sister and Bobby the Brain Heenan, who always came to a fast defense of Nails on WWF TV. Aside from obviously having Bobby the Brain Heenan on his side, Nails didn't form many alliances when he was with the WWF, but he did briefly team with Razor Ramon and Kamala for six-man tag team action against The Undertaker, The Ultimate Warrior, and The Big Boss Man. Did Nails confide anything about his incarceration with these short-lived teammates? Several years ago, I tracked down Kamala after an indie show, and I asked him that specific question, and of course, I have audio of the conversation, and here it is. Hey, Kamala, Kamala, hey, when you teamed with Nails back in the WWF, did he ever tell you, you know, why he was incarcerated, what crime he committed, or anything like that? So, yeah, that was Kamala's reply to my question. Let me see, let me check my paperwork. Um, that, that, inter that brief interview took place in uh, back in 2008 after making his statement about the situation Kamala slapped his belly a few times you know so take it for what it's worth but to me that says a lot 
Now around the time that I talked to Kamala many years ago, I ran into Brutus the Barber Beefcake when he was working as a ticket guy in that subway station and I asked him about nails and he was seconds away from telling me what he knew about nails when he accidentally spilled his cocaine in the booth and then immediately called the police and told them that it was anthrax. So seeing this craziness unfold in front of me, I got the hell out of there. But that same day, I also saw Virgil signing autographs in the same subway station, and I asked him if Nails had confided anything about his past, you know, when Nails was beating the crap out of him at SummerSlam 92 at Wembley Stadium in London, England. Now, Virgil said he'd tell me everything that he knew about Nails if I bought one of his autograph photographs for $75. Needless to say, I declined. When Nails inexplicably vanished from the WWF, he reemerged for one night in WCW at Slambury 93. Billed simply as the prisoner, he replaced Scotty Norton and fought Sting in a bounty match. Then Nails hit the indie scene in the short-lived AWF, still wearing his orange numbered prison jumpsuit all the time and still freaking angry. But let's look at Slambury 93 for a moment, shall we? The WCW announced team of Tony Schiavone and Larry Zbysko told the viewing audience that Nails took out Scott Norton and thereby took Norton's spot against Sting in that bounty match. But not unlike all backstage, in-ring, or unseen attacks in the world of professional wrestling, to the best of our knowledge, criminal charges against Nails, i.e. the prisoner, were never filed for this alleged assault on Scott Flash Norton. However, despite feigning surprise when they saw the prisoner walk through the curtain as Sting's surprise opponent at Slambury 93 and failing to know that the prisoner was in the building that night in the same breath the WCW announcer somehow knew that the prisoner attacked Scott Norton and incapacitated him to the point where he couldn't compete and thereby the prisoner would be replacing Norton against Sting on that night Phew. so let me get this straight the announcers didn't know that Nails was there in the building, yet they somehow knew why he was there. This makes no sense. And once again, with these conflicting and contradictory statements, I smell a conspiracy to frame Nails the prisoner for a crime that he didn't commit against Scotty Norton. Hell, it's no wonder that Nails left WCW so freaking fast. They were trying to frame his ass the second he walked in the goddamn door. And hey, what about those court records and any other legal documents that may be floating around? Considering that the big boss man worked as a prison guard in Cobb County, Georgia, and the boss man's treatment of nails inside said prison was the bone of contention in the WWF between the two men, I focused my research in Cobb County, Georgia. However, no records can be found of anyone named Nails ever being convicted or serving time in Cobb County or the state of Georgia for that matter. Now, for the sake of argument, I looked elsewhere. After an exhausting state-by-state -state search, there are no court records or transcripts or any prison records for anyone known simply as Nails, predating Nails' WWF debut in 1992 or thereafter. In addition, there are no newspaper or TV reports of any crimes committed by someone simply known as Nails. There are no lawsuits filed by anyone named Nails, something that would have been public record if, in the interim, Nails decided to sue for his false imprisonment and the police brutality that he suffered while in the prison system. There were no requests for a pardon in or out of the state of Georgia either, which tells me that there was a vast conspiracy to cover up and keep Nails' false imprisonment hushed up and covered up. Where are these documents? Let me tell you, there are obvious political and financial powers at work here, people. So, all this said, we do know that Nails was capable of theft because, after all, he stole the big boss man's nightstick on national TV. We all saw it. There's no denying it. We know that Nails was capable of brutalizing people in and out of the ring. But did Nails do whatever unknown crimes he was accused of committing in the first place? I don't believe so. And I have two pieces of damning evidence to substantiate my thesis. First, in 1993, Hasbro Toys issued a Nails action figure as a part of their awesomely nostalgic WWF Hasbro toy line. Now, if Nails was truly guilty of the crimes he was imprisoned for, would Hasbro, a publicly traded company worth billions of dollars, risk their good name and reputation by knowingly producing a toy for children of an allegedly violent criminal madman? Absolutely not. They would never do it. Obviously, at the time, Hasbro knew much more about Nails and his alleged crimes and alleged criminal activity than we were ever told. And they knew enough 
to safely produce that action figure and market said figure towards children. Second in my theory, we need to flash ahead to 1994 approximately one year after the Hasbro Toy of Nails was released and approximately two years after Nails vanished from the WWF. Because in 1994, the infamous steroid trial of Vince McMahon occurred, a trial that almost brought the WWF empire crashing down amid a fury of drug and other nasty allegations. Now, at this trial, Nails testified against Vince McMahon. Now, I have read the transcript of Nails' testimony, and after reading it several times, I stopped looking at what was said, and I started looking at what wasn't said. Follow me. When Nails was on the stand testifying against Vince McMahon, at no time did Vince McMahon's defense team bring up the alleged crimes that Nails allegedly committed prior to competing with the WWF. Now, having watched the People's Court with Judge Wapner and to a small extent Matlock when I was a little clown, you would have expected Vince McMahon and his defense team to mention these crimes that by Vince McMahon's own admission on national television put Nails in prison for over 2,000 days, you know, as a means of damaging Nails' credibility and thereby damaging his testimony. Right or wrong, legal or illegal, you would have expected Vince McMahon's defense team to use Nails' prison record to challenge the entire Nails' testimony against Vincent Kennedy McMahon, yet they did not. Now this would be your standard TV courtroom style theatrics and drama that again you would expect from attorneys representing someone like Vince McMahon, even if it was simply to put a shred of doubt in the jury's collective minds about Nails' testimony and his credibility, and especially considering the unpleasant history between Vince McMahon and Nails, which has been discussed in the annals of pro wrestling history for over two decades, you would think that McMahon's hatred of Nails would have forced his ego to bring up that prison record, even if it was simply to embarrass Nails on the stand. But this did not happen, and I believe it didn't happen, because Vince McMahon and his defense team knew that Nails was innocent, and thereby bringing up the subject of his false incarceration would and could have tainted and offended the jury once evidence of Nails' innocence was submitted to the court. I believe Vince McMahon's legal team realized it could backfire and could have been viewed as the defense attacking the character of a witness, so they didn't do it. So again, when analyzing the steroid trial testimony, it's not what was said, it's what wasn't said, people. And as a postscript on the transcript of the steroid trial, we all know, depending on your views of the case, for good or ill, Vince McMahon still walked away from the steroid trial a free man, the testimony of Nails notwithstanding. And alas, with this evidence, my theory, my thesis, my thesis theory, I believe that we can conclude that Nails was an innocent man probably entitled to millions of dollars from whatever state falsely convicted and imprisoned him for whatever crimes they falsely claimed he committed. You know what I'm saying? And hey, at all else, I think the man deserves a flippin' retrial. And stay tuned, because the next pro wrestling mystery that Ripper the Clown plans to solve is why Asuka and Shinsuke Nakamura's respective names both have U's in them, yet most of the U's are completely silent. Alas, this is the biggest mystery in professional wrestling today. And in relation to this silent U mystery, I will also address and present an expose on how everyone has been apparently mispronouncing the Great Muda, Kintsuki Sasaki, Yuji Nagata, Jushin Thunder Liger, Ultimo Dragon, Mr. Fuji, Yokozuna, and Tatsumi Fujinami's respective names for decades. I am Ripper the Clown. Oh.